Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 14th online reading event. My name is Tom Snarsky, and I'm happy to be the MC of tonight's reading. Uh, in case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we usually feature around 10 readers, and if I'm lucky with the timing, one small cat. Um, and those 10 readers each have about five minutes to share a selection of their writing with us. 10 slots means we are always looking for readers because Asparagus can't do it all by himself. He would love to, but he can't. Um, so if you are a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing your work at a future event, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us via the Performance Anxiety Twitter account, which is at Performance A-N-X-T, uh, or you can DM the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky, T-O-M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y on Twitter uh, or Instagram. Jeez, I'm very bad at Instagram, but you can message me there if you want. Uh, or you can email me at tomsnarski at gmail.com. Uh, you can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, the other co-organizer of the series, whom I am very happy to introduce now as our first reader. So Kristen Garth is a pushcart, best of the net, and wrestling nominated sonnet stalker. Her sonnets have stocked journals like Glass, Yes, 521, Luna Luna, and more. She's the author of 15 books of poetry, including Pink Plastic House and Shut Your Eyes Succubi, both from Maverick Duck Press, Crow Carriage and Candy Child Cigarette, oh, sorry, Candy Cigarette Woman Child Noir from the Hedgehog Poetry Press, Flutter Southern Gothic Fever Dream from Twisted Press, and The Meadow from Apep Publications, which was just released and which I'm really excited to hear some poems from tonight. I got to review that book and I love it dearly. Um, she's the founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and she's also, of course, the co-founder of Performance Anxiety. So take it away, Kristen. Sorry, I, I should know your bio by heart by now, but thank you for your patience <laughs> as I trip over it. Thank you. I just got my um, copies of my book, The Meadow, from APEP this week, and it's been really exciting, so I'm going to be reading all from my BDSM sexual memoir. <laughs> so um, the first thing I was going to read is just a little tiny poem that I wrote inside of it. It's not a sonnet, but it's just to explain kind of how um, these poems poems that I wrote are both sex positive and sex negative, I guess you would say. I mean, they go through bad experiences that led me to good things. So this is a little tiny poem about that. Small town sex object. They will see. Small town sex object. Not the stumbles of the awkward and the aching. Forsaken fawn forsaking what everyone was already taking in the meadow. And the meadow was, um, was what I called my subspace because I was submissive. I am a submissive. And that's what this book is about is, you know, from a, you know, female point of view of being submissive and feeling, you know, being a small town person and trying to look to have those experiences, which um, that's this little tiny poem called Small Town. It gets around in smaller towns who hold you down where you've been found how deep they've been the multiple men strangleholds requisite to come upon a blacked out beach aquarium you're baptized in much too young and then the book continues and you know there's a lot of um different poems um about some negative experiences with people but it gets into what i call the sex object section and that is it's fully where i found my way into the bdsm world and i did that by first you know on the computer and meeting people online and then and i was very young, so i was scared to meet people in real life and i wrote a poem called dangerous about that they tell me you are dangerous these ones online who chat with us, strange men who want inside of me, with avatars, forked tongues, and anonymity, grown girls who haunt this chat room too, all seeking daddies just like you, an advocate in custom suits, your cinnamon bears and dark pursuits, brushed and braided grad school hair, a selfie lewd and, go and goosebumps, underwear, and bubblegum you'd like to taste. A cheekiness I'd like you to debase. Email proof that you're the one. I am aware what will be done. Some fright and shivers, but I can't help but pursue. 
because I'm dangerous, just like you. And the next two poems are both um, also deep, dirty, and denial. And um, the um, denial, well, anyway, I'll just read dirty. You want me dirty, as you see, the out to match the in of me. I tell you all the filth inside, each evil deed and doubt, each cock I ride. My baby face, they fall for fast, those other ones who never last. They wouldn't do the things you do, to hold my cheek beneath their shoe. They'd be aghast to watch me crawl, to ride your cruel control. They don't know me at all. They buy the lie of how I look, a princess face, a cry mistook. Don't talk to me. Don't ask why I cannot breathe at times and want to die. You see in me all the others I've hurt. You're not afraid to put me in the dirt. And this is my last poem that I'm going to read from it, and it's called Denial. And it's about orgasm control, which I do not like, <laughs> and, and drove me crazy. And so I wrote this poem. Denial. A dark discussion of denial, detailed by dirty digits, dozens deputized to document disgrace. Desire, derailed, deprived, described, defined, and digitized. A diary delineates her dreams. Each dick and drip depiction demanded, delivers data, disciples debate, demons drivel, dilatorious, disband, is disappointed as denial drives their dainty, droll, demented, doll, distraught. Demonic devotion she derives, dispensing dirty deeds. Dollars for desire, devils in the details of her denial. Dire dance for one his quorum does defile. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Kristen, for that alliterative tour de force to wrap up our first reading <laughs> slot. That was awesome. And that, that poem, uh, I think maybe all the poems you read uh, tonight, right, are from The Meadow? Is that true? Oh, all of them, yeah. I just read them from the book. Yeah. <laughs> They're cool, all yeah. So if, so if you want to get a copy of that book, which is in a gorgeous edition from uh, Jeremy Gawkey's APEP Publications, you can find it at apeppublications.com. Um, you can also find more about Kristen's work at Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Garth.com. And you can follow her on Twitter, uh, whether it's about following more of Kristen's poems or getting in touch about performance anxiety stuff, at Lola and Jolie. So L-O-L-A-A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E. So thank you again so much, Kristen, for opening this up. And I'm really excited. Uh, we have a lot of folks tonight who are returning uh, to performance anxiety. Uh, so it's awesome to hear familiar voices. And one of our returners tonight, our second reader for the evening, uh, is Eric Fuhrer. And Eric Fuhrer is the author of four books of poetry, including Not Human Enough for the Census from Vegetarian Alcoholic Press. His next book, In Which I Take Myself Hostage, is forthcoming from Spoit and Doivel Press at the end of the year. So thanks so much for coming back on, Eric. You slayed it last time, and I cannot wait to hear these poems tonight. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'll be reading from Not Human Enough for the Census, um, and I'm going to start by reading the, what is the title poem, kind of. Um, so it's called The Creature of Dark Habits. The creature of dark habits is whispering an echo to my other face that I created so that the creature would have someone to finger. The way I move my eyebrows as a mask of feathers that the creature's fingers pull through my body, my face's body, my finger body. Many times at night, I look into the creature and slide under the pillow like a feathered toad. Yes, we are closer than your eyes. Flicker the shutter against our bodies. If you want to capture the time when tethers were needed to restrain the body from dying in its own skin, which stuttered its goosebumps all over the damn house, creating a mess that I fingered up with a paper finger, a finger that I cut out from an origami flower with a stem that went on forever, which ends up amounting to the number of hairs that are on the stomach of a tick 
whose legs crick against the shadow created by my tethered teeth. You see, they don't want me to bite anymore because my signature is too familiar for any lab because I was born, I was born, I was born a child who is a finger whose body is a hangnail who knows at least three math problems right out of the womb. The most important being anything times zero is zero. And therefore he bites his hangnail down to the cuticle so people call him flesh boy. They call him cute little icicle. They call him if they need money, blow, cigarettes, a good time, a slice of ham, another excuse for not being quite human enough for the census. Okay. Shorter one, kind of a prose poem. The organ breathers. The organ breeders took a day off to be organ breathers because there was a typo on the memo that day and they were bred to be literal. So they took a deep breath and pressed their lips against the cold skin of a cirrhotic liver, which miraculously sputtered and spit as they exhaled and uh, the, as they exhaled and life spilled from its ochre body. Triumphantly, the organ breathers continued blowing their life into the liver's puckered flesh in slow, steady streams. Once it blushed, they placed it in the body of a young mare, which instantly revived and bucked its mane in joy. And then one more. Wolves wrestling shovels. Wolves wrestling shovels from their mouths, moths flustering flickers of dog's tooth jammed against the transmission of that thing called love, which you caress every yesterday with a pair of hands borrowed from the shelf of a priest who lopped off a limb every Tuesday for contrition, for ammunition, for a day when he could walk on water without any feet and multiply fishes using only his tongue, which is in a glass jar next to his teeth, next to his pianoforte, continuously playing Bach's Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3. I only play on the left side of the piano because I have black lung, and I am a flitter in the ashtray, a whimper in a glass, a hollow stutter in the window pane, a gutted body of a fish, a swift swipe of light on the subfloor with as large crack in the foundation. Make sure you put on some rouge, so at least the disaster is a beautiful disaster, a volcano exploding with a glistening lips. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for those poems and for also uh, the brief shout out to math and the identity uh, I, or like, yeah, zero as multiplicative identity. That was really cool because I teach math every day and I like that a lot. So if you would like to find more of Eric's work, you can find Eric on Twitter at Eric Fuhrer, E-R-I-K-F-U-H. R -E -R. Uh, but you can also find more of his work in those two books that he mentioned, um, Not Human Enough for the Census, that we heard the sort of title poem from, from Vegetarian Alcoholic, and also uh, In Which I Take Myself Hostage. You can find information about those at eric-fuhrer.com. Um, and his blog also has a five-question interview feature that he invites everybody to be a part of. Kristen Garth, our very own Kristen, was the first feature. And you can DM him on Twitter or email him from his website to participate. So thank you again, Eric, so much. Uh, and may math represent itself in more poems forever going forward. Um, and our next reader is another returner to performance anxiety, who I spend most of my time exchanging messages with about our respective cats. So I'm really excited to have her back on. And so is Asparagus. So that is Sarah Matson. And Sarah Matson's poetry has been nominated for Best of the Net 2019, and it can be found or is forthcoming, sorry, in Impossible Task, Bone Bouquet, The Journal Petra, and elsewhere. Sarah's chapbook, Electric Grandma, is now available from another new calligraphy. She and I are pressmates, which I feel very lucky to to have that be my situation. And her chaplet, Forgotten Women in Science, is also available from Damaged Goods Press. Uh, Sarah's quarantined in Chicago with her husband and the aforementioned cats, and she tweets at Skeletor Writes. So thanks so much, Sarah, for being back on. Take it away. Hi there, thank you so much for having me back. It's really such a pleasure to be reading with all you incredible folks tonight, um, especially during this really wild time that we're all experiencing. <laughs> 
Um, the first poem I'm reading tonight is inspired by a music video. Um, the music video Sour Girl from the band Stone Temple Pilots. I'm not really a fan of their music. It's just that one video that oh, really, really stuck with me. Um, so this poem is called Sour Girl. Glossy black childhood lips. Moonlight black light to sharp points. Church fingers. Illuminate my elongated ears and illustrated heart. My brother floats through wearing the vinyl pants and fishnet tank he stole from me in junior high. Then there's chalky whispers and sweaty smiles. She smells like an effortless vampire. Oiled sternum melting to golden porcelain in a puff of frenetic tai chi and necky sinew. Dislocated velvet sleeves and late 90s facial hair too high to lip sync the bridge. Stemming, steaming, an eyebrow. Chewing hair extensions, thumbs and eye sockets, kisses given how snakes wound in pairs. Blood smeared voice conjuring. Recycled astroturf and violent paper masks. Catch my wick as I lift her blinking from the packing foam, spray painted avocado and coated in green screen sentimental garbage. She is a drug, a poisonous metaphor killing me as oversexed narcissist clutching life between displaced shoulder, blades curious. Bend of fingers as I stroke tendrils of a prenatal television sensation and lie to her in the sour earth. My next poem tonight, um, I'm super honored to say, is forthcoming in Bone Bouquet. Uh, this is called Sweater Fetish. A decrepit character living with Angora in the freezer. Cashmere tits, a bullet bra, grandmother simplicity in the tiger's eyes. Boots forcing your pretty things. Another disinterested cowboy in a tiered leather jacket and no socks. Wow! He can tap dance and say, damn, almighty oh, gods above illuminate my generation. I am fictional and beloved and therefore immortal. What pillow talk? Suffocate lust fire with wild gold dust punctuated by whimsy, often occurring just below the cheekbone. Throaty shot fired across meaty wounds, rattled and burned his underbelly naked, yet unrevealed and unscathed. He marveled at illusory identities, skating along weekend crushes. Uh, my final poem this evening uh, is forthcoming from my collection that concerns the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. Um, along with everything else terrible that's happening in the world, um, Chernobyl is back in the news because it's on fire, <laughs> uh, which is the result of wildfires and arson uh, in the region. Uh, so this poem is called Murmur. The air has secrets or souls chattering in wind swirls. What do structures tell us? I thought Chernobyl's voice was the hot itch of the dosimeter pinpricks inside pores, a warning. You're here, I'm here, let's old west it. Corsets and laudanum, a cyborgian revolution, violent, choose your own adventure. We have HBO. This pen writes nicely, but I am the only one who will ever know that. And I bet a lot of astronauts and nuclear engineers thought the exact same thing during some pivotal moment. Bled from virulent decay, I'm sure I'll know when I find it, because I know I don't have it yet. Up the dosage, turn down the volume, keep climbing. I'm almost there. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Stay safe, uh, and if you're able, stay home. I am Sarah Matson.
Thank you so much, Sarah, for those beautiful poems. And if you'd like to learn more about Sarah's publications, again, her chapbook, Electric Grandma, is available from Another New Calligraphy. Uh, and her chaplet, Forgotten Women in Science, is available from Damaged Goods Press. And I look forward to reading uh, more about Chernobyl in this forthcoming collection. And uh, if you want to follow Sarah on Twitter, you can do that at Skeletor Writes. So S-K-E-L-E-T-O-R-W-R-I. TES. So um, from nuclear disaster to our next reader, so no no pressure. Um, but our next reader, I'm very excited to welcome. Um, they're actually going to be serving double duty tonight, and we'll talk more about that later. But our next reader is Anna McColgan. And Anna McColgan wrote, I Want You to Live, which is available on the Marls Karks website and Patreon. And we'll hear from uh, Marls Karks' own Matilda Cullen later this evening. Uh, Anna, thanks so much for being here tonight and I, I love this book and I can't wait. Yeah, Matilda's got it right there. Super awesome. We're so excited to hear these poems. Thanks so much. Oh yeah, but I did I do think I got you muted tragically. But yeah, here we are. I think oh, okay, we can cool. hear you now. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. perfect. Okay, Thanks so good, much. Good, good. All right. Uh so the first poem I'm gonna start off with tonight is one that I wrote recently. Um it's the most frantic of the poems I'm going to read, and then we're going to chill out like uh, as we go, if that's cool with everybody. So, <laughs> okay, this one is called Belly Children, Part One. Their thing is the opposite of my thing. I just grew here in this place. They stood across. I'm just breathing. What they really mean is choke when they say thank you. Joke's on you. Your pattern's not in style. Eat your smart out and your girlfriend. Quiz a sharper tool out of the faucet. Count the capital improvements. Count supplies. Increase capacity. There are children in my stomach that I swear I didn't eat and can't digest. People singing to the sound of all the sweat. Wishful thinking bleeds my gums unmend from teeth so I can lose them in the ankle of whoever thinks it is a good idea to have a prison. You may hear those fucking monsters when what I said was now. And that is just about as far as I have gotten. I haven't gotten very far. But yes, there are monsters who will still make boring conversation. I wait all day for the emergency door sound, siphon towards a retrieval in the tempo of alarm. Makes more sense than waiting to hear music in a building built against whatever makes it. So that was the first one. This next one I'm gonna read. Oh, thanks for those virtual snaps, bud. <laughs> this next one I'm gonna read is called Poem in Which Women Stop Working and Write Poems. Brain not a dungeon, heart not a time clock, pulse not a punishment. Eyes not a camera, hands not for granted, legs not an engine. Mouth not a seam, nails for scratching itches. Please don't make me use them for what else I do know how. Now stop what you are doing, put it down. The dish, the pliers, bucket, folder, keyboard, package, bags you carry, jackhammer, the fabric, phone, all worthy worries about other people's stomachs, limbs, and yes, the item. Right there where you're scanning it, just let it fall. Forget barcodes, forget numbers. Not forever, but I'll tell you something if you'll just come here. That line isn't going anywhere. And that line promises to disappear. So write it, just pretend there's a malfunction. Set the pace, you tick like that on purpose. Waiting hands can wait a little longer. Watching eyes can see or look away for however long it takes you to remember what you're holding when you hold your breath. It could collapse the economic order, could halt all machines of death. Lady cops and bosses wouldn't get it since we'd passed the message with a look. And this would not begin a compilation, the flattening of voices in a book. But napkin network, scraps of paper, old receipts from newly idle hand to idle hand. And anyone who hovers over shoulders, forced to face what they don't understand. And anywhere you could find words of women, lipstick couplets on the windows of the train, 
or the mirror in the doctor's office bathroom where she had come to fix the drain. The buildings of the city would be tatted as the line stretched out the door. Beneath each line, a threat, a question. What have we been doing all this for? So that's that one. <laughs> the last two that I'm going to read were both per, uh, put up on Marles Kark's page just the other day. Um, and so you can go check them out there if you want to. This first one's called Bickering with Bonnie. <clears throat> it's um, Sean Bonnie who I'm referring to. Buddy, you have said it. You have really said it. Much of what there is to say. But when it comes to... We know who lies. The holders of the deeds still think a poem is a sigh. Of course, they talk about it all day long, describe an earplug, but I am never talking about that kind of, and my friends are never talking about that kind of love. Today was some guy saying, I don't want to fucking touch you. Say it back. Love today was walking on the boss. Of course, it isn't who or how they'd hang it. That museum is closed till further notice. Behind another line we could all cross. And the last one I'm going to read to you is called Without Touch. Without touch, skin always glows, as in reaching. Want without direction, the other state prohibited swallowing. An open mouth still does not have to take whatever shit might be thrown in it. I know I am not yet sick because I am still making music. I mean mucus. Want to look at it? It is a sign of my fertility I war against. I will meet you at the corner of bloodthirst and compassion. We can watch each other in states of undress. It's not self-evident, but known that skin is reaching off the bones and inconveniently disproving hopelessness. And that is all. Wow. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you oh. so much, Anna. And thank you not only for the work that you've done sharing these awesome poems with us, but also um, if, like me, you're like, do it again, do it again, then you will get to hear more of Anna's reading uh, in just a few more readers, um, because Anna has very generously volunteered to share some work by Meredith Hanlon, who can't be here with us tonight. So uh, hold on to your hats. But before you hold on to your hats, please check out the Marls Karks website and Patreon, which you can find at Marls Karks, M-A-R-L-S-K-A. Rx, um, and that is run by Matilda Cullen, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes. But also, you can follow Anna directly on Twitter at Scrapfruits, S-C-R-A-P-F-R-U-I-T. So that that was great. And I'm really excited to move from one spirit of collaboration and of, of just general kickassery to another one in Amy Alexander, who is returning tonight as a reader to Performance Anxiety, and also, I think, has a collaboration slash theater piece kind of thing that she's going to be sharing with us, too. So uh, Amy lives, writes, and draws in Baton Rouge. She's a Ruth Lilly Fellowship recipient and the author of The Legend of the Kettle Daughter from the Hedgehog Poetry Press. She has survived the coronavirus quarantine with form poems, Bela Bartok, and The Office. So to Amy, thank you so much. And I think we'll also be hearing from Kristen, but I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so happy to be here. Um, yes, I'm going to be reading tonight from a book that I wrote in uh, 2011. It's called Finding Betty Crocker. You can get it on Amazon, but it's, it's a few years old, but it's still, I come back to it and I'm like, dang, I can't believe I wrote that. So um, this is a story, uh, this is a, uh, the story of Betty Crocker if she were given a voice. She was fictional. She was created uh, to market cake mixes and other products. So um, I kind of thought it would be great to give her a voice and so that's kind of what this book is about and um through the book she kind of falls apart and the poem i'm going to read is called with Kristen. Kristen garth is going to read the other voice because it's two voices um and this this poem takes place in the book right when she's starting to spiral a little bit out so she's been very she's been very buttoned up and now she's losing it so 
Um, this is maybe one thing that prompts her to lose it. I'm going to stand up for this because I'm going to get in touch with my theater side. All right. <laughs> so, bridge day. Betty Crocker has the ladies over to play bridge. Bridge day, she calls it. She takes Gouda like blood beaded from a dragon. Bangs it on the butcher block. So a fine silk goes airborne and just as suddenly falls. She carves out voodoo designs. Last week it was Mayan. She goes for pre-Columbian. Today it's almost as if the knife tells her what to do. The legs of the women in the skin, big nippled like Mae West, spread open to expose a flame of exact impropriety. Betty exhales as she carves that part. It's all part of a grand culture scheme. The ladies at Bridge Day could use such a view. Betty rests the silver blade, steps back on a sensible shoe. She has made this new thing. It's like nothing ever carved from the skin of cheese before. Oh, Betty, your house is so lovely. And how is it you made your kitchen? Is this Cuban, Betty? Mayan, Lucy. Lucky Lucy with the buttons of bone, with the fine linen shift. Sit here. Scrim of wood on the linoleum with its circles inside and inside again. And what is it what you've done with the cheese, Betty? Betty, is that what I think it is? Oh, Betty, I think maybe you've stepped too far. Betty, what would Mr. Crocker think of this, that you put this into cheese? Now, I'm on a voodoo kick, Lucy. I'm all into that, up to my temples, in. But no bother, if it bothers you, here. Betty Crocker places the point of the knife square into the spot on the cheese where Mae West's heart would rest. She muscles in. Her wrist rises up and with a thwack, voodoo girl with ankles gone this away, gone that away, splits in two. Now, Betty, look what you've done. You've gone and ruined all you've worked for. Here, here, dear, let me slice it up for you. Let me put it on crackers for you. See, Betty, like this. Lucy's fingers reach into the clouded olive jar. She pulls them out. They are like witchy pebbles from the Baltic Sea. And soon a whole line of crackers, a satisfying Nazi army of hors d'oeuvres stretches across the table. Thank you. <laughs> wow beautiful scene thank you so much i'm like like yeah my my processing powers are like right here and I'm like, wow, <laughs> what do i do with the nazi crackers i don't know but i do know that one thing you could do if you would if you want to learn more about amy's work is that you can find again her title the legend of the kettle daughter which is available from the hedgehog poetry press um but you can also follow amy directly on twitter at i r i e M -O -M. So thank you so much, Amy, for bringing again the spirit thank of collaboration you. to performance anxiety, the spirit of thank the theater. Thank you, Kristen. Too. Yeah, thank and you, Kristen, Kristen. Again, thank you for the for for um, being voice number two. Otherwise, you know, there would be no Nazi crackers, and <laughs> what would we do without them? Um, so I, I'm really excited to introduce our next reader. Um, someone who we've already heard some, about some of their projects uh, earlier this evening, um, Matilda Cullen. And Matilda is tired and, and angry, but she's currently writing a series of essays on Sean Bonney, who we heard a little bit about from Anna, um, and contemporary communist poetries. She runs Prol Sound, which is a podcast and archive of contemporary leftist poetry. You can find it on Twitter at Prol Sound, P-R-O-L-E-S-O-U-N-D. Um, and Tom and myself and, uh, and Anna have appeared on it uh, a few times. My, I'm really happy to have a recording of Hennecker stitch on there and you're actually going to get to hear a preview um, in a few minutes of the work that Anna did reading um, Meredith's book on there too. So Matilda, it's really, really exciting to have you on um, Performance Anxiety and I can't wait to hear what you're going to share with us tonight. 
Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read some poems from that are mostly not published, but I've been putting them on the Twitter timeline because that is now a publishing venue. <laughs> so I'm going to start out with a poem, uh, which is also a letter and a, uh, and a statement of poetics. Fuck death. Articulating an aesthetic via negative capability. Not landlords or MFAs. I don't want palms but bombs. Fires to crack the walls of my teeth. No poets. None of that pedestal crap. Smashing literature and all its silverware. There are only knives and night. No one can even think revolt. Only words about to burst into imminent insurrection. None of us are comfortable and neither should those corrosive documents of purified hatred. Poetry, whatever that is, has one task right now. To dissolve itself in wretched twilight light, poems as sharpened pitchforks, songs as oblique rooms inside which you'll find a horizon taken off in bird flight, and absolute love, sparks to start prairie fires, phrases bleeding into action, etc. Poems are not barricades, they will not shield you from bullets, they are pressure points to drop a city into its negative self, to cut a fissure in the wall of a moment, unwritten, as in carving scraped off caves and trains, projected, ripped off, dipped in the blood of our loved ones, those souls that burn inside us or whatever. If what you want is palms, poets, pretty shit to quote and sing, you are still the enemy. Here are the documents of our survival and the blueprints of our love. All power and solidarity, Matilda. And then I have uh, three poems from a set that's largely inspired by Bonnie's The Commons. Uh, but also just this is the only way I've been able to get myself to write recently in this like kind of very narrow form. A garment of sound wrapped around each artifice of day. Deduct one crow airspace, one collage antibiotic, one check, one two, check, several fanged bed nest, course correct, adjust angle of jaw broke open, angle of relation jut at unpredicted intervals the way a night cope open, a bed yoke in head sun, a quell enough dead star, do none of the wind flip, none of the street. <clears throat> Sever the rain. It's music all over me. Compound bed as nest of arms, shelves collecting dusk. I walk across the night to mask a meadow in blistering acoustic, a breast, a blush, song sparrow, no additional text, dear as tree-like, a number of nouns on the shore, names crossed out, rain again but harder, the rain, Icarax a tristera, stitch stutter evening, else I'll itch a mismission, cusp of winter, cup of weather, ground bent in oblique effigy. And this one is written after Mer Meredith. Oh, enchanting melancholy that has so bitterly wrapped around my throne, my trenchant sculpture of a lung night in the rowan underbrush, in the swept up after on, another bed, another strike, whose labored breath went up in eye fuck with 10,000 hands, 10,000 eyes licked the reaching from my chest, sucked the aching from my arms, and thank you, I have never been held by eyes so yovis in perpetual storm. And then I'll read like one or two more. These are from a different set. Uh, this one is actually appearing in a chat book that uh, Dom Knowles is doing. Um, uh, I forget the name of the chat book, but it's like poems uh, after Sean Vane, of course, because that's all I know how to do. <laughs> uh, the title is We Were Rusting Inside Your House. Wrap old night's head in garland, make it stutter, call it winter, call the eye light a movie, call the movie a faulty landscape. Here there's nothing but noise, dictionary of birdsong, cataloged those alien flutters into neat and spectral order. M. Tightrope, M. Dunsinane, in the cold of this loud morning sunlight is singing it is built on glass and scratches weird ringing in town even tried to shop found myself lost found myself overrun found myself overrun 
uh, spinning in every direction, this all fluorescent trepidation, this and evidence of lost days, that and where was I inside burning effervescent history, am walking on Wednesday, scratch that, evaporate every direction, compass inverted, its organs pronounced dead and spinning faster, the walls punctuate their own demolition, and the city is not a city, the calendar and sundials plummet in weatherwise alterity, look, deeds bleed from phrases, our first order was to shoot every clock, to break the hands that hold the hour, to drip time in hydrochloric acid and wring our fingers out. Tell me, O oh dread brother, who let the sunlight scream so bright. I think that's all I'm going to read for now. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Patilla, for sharing those poems with us. I, I love the ones that are going straight to the timeline, and I just think that the way that they're coming out is is really exciting. And um, I also want to stress that Matilda's got so much really awesome stuff going on that she's doing to share poetry with the world. Um, you can follow her directly on Twitter and see these poems as they appear on the timeline at Matildork, which is M-A-T-H-I-L-D-O-R-K. Um, also, we talked about Prol Sound, the podcast and archive earlier, and Marls Karks at M-A-R-L-S-K-A-R-X, the magazine and monthly sort of publication situation uh, where you can find Anna's book. Um, and also, um, I am very happy to report that Matilda Heath, the last part of the plug cool stuff part of the like form to say, please buy uh, Meredith's chat book. So Meredith Hanlon um, is our next reader. Unfortunately, can't be with us tonight live and in person because they are uh, symptomatic um, and were exposed to COVID-19. So they weren't feeling up to it. Um, and we really want them to rest and recover and feel better as soon as humanly possible. But because we're lucky and live in a world where people believe in Meredith's poems because they're amazing. Um, Anna, who you heard a little bit from earlier, is going to read some of those poems. So I'm just going to really briefly introduce Meredith, um, and then Anna's going to take it away and read some really amazing work. Um, and we'll talk about how you can get access to that and support uh, Meredith right at the end. So um, Meredith Hanlon was a worker in the gig economy and had 11 jobs between two time zones in the last four years. Uh, they've been exposed to, as we said, and are symptomatic for COVID-19. They're fighting for stimulus money and unemployment insurance right now, and they've really published a chapbook, Zip Ties Between Zip Codes, which is available via Gumroad, and we'll tell you how in a few minutes. Um, Mara's resting and recovering, so again, their poems are going to be shared tonight by their friend and collaborator, Anna McColgan. So Anna, thank you so much for, for doing this, and we're really excited to hear Meredith's poems tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm honestly grateful to get to, you know, stand in if such a thing is possible for such a great person and poet as Meredith is. So, you know, um, this is an opportunity for me to like get get to read these. Um, I love these poems. Like you really should read the book, Zip Ties Between Zip Codes. Okay, first one that I'm gonna read uh, is in the book number uh, 18. It's after Sung Yim. <clears throat> I only wanted to go to grad school so I could sit down without having to take up chain smoking with my inhaler. I only wanted to make poetry so I could stop lying. I only wanted to write in all lowercase because capitalism's disease has killed, is killing, will soon kill all tenses, loves of my life and me. This is going to kill me. It always was. Now it's just faster and louder. Didn't know it would be from the box office to the few hundred wristbands I plastered on club kids before the end of public life. They want to soothe us to death. A 3.5K banner biplane to thank workers to death. Take a month long nap, then clock in to death. Corporatocracy spends expensive syllables branding us for death. They release the numbers so we can brace for death. They can say they tried to warn us while they push in the knife. My chest is dead tight as every voice on the phone says nothing, nothing but goodbye. Or I'll die brown paper bagging and proud. Fuck death. None of this is new. Though faggots and our friends are always the first to die, we know where all the useful plants are, make the only good bread. Our aim is true, queer as in fuck you and your civility. 
This is not a poem. My unfinished, unfinished manuscript works better as fuel. I want to grow into a bomb, bloom on the Department of Homeland Security and the FDA, oil a gun to do work on the Capitol building, wrap calloused hands around a Clinton's windpipe, starch a shirt and infiltrate a party of all the rich fit to eat from the DNC, get their flight dates and cruise numbers. The election is a fucking joke and so is your degree. How many more times do you need to hear them say they want us dead and are making bank off it before we consider you completely? Complicit. How specific must genocide be to you to get you to poison the whole administration? So many poppies grow wild in the West Coast weather perdition, unyielding, unfazed. The billionaire class lives. Beautiful friend, I want to press you a bouquet for your notebook and boil the root and seeds for later. Get a real job, like killing the right people. They have real fucking jobs killing us. All right, I'm going to read one more. Also, just letting you know, these are the poems that Meredith selected for me to read tonight. So, like, this is all creative control on their part as well. Okay. This is number 17. <clears throat> I am measuring everything like knowing how little there is keeps it precious. Instead of a process, I have a backpack. Instead of security, trade pockets of shame, cherry pits and a $5 sleeve of nickels, pile of light, polite violence. Tell me, I am all places I have been ousted from. Tell me. I am your favorite tangle of barbed wire. Some bird was onto something when they cried, yes, 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 but what if there is no difference anymore between love and riot? That's probably where the revolution is. Nor'eastern shore towns will erode before they catch. My Philadelphia will catch before it flees. Cleveland could flee or burn, and low California whole held hostage to old spark plugs through October anyway. Communism comes in envelopes, and though infection takes all paper these days, I will not be shamed from my sincerity. We are not dead until we are dead. No tetanus shots for irony poisoning, trouble down debt. Our thinnest dimes stand stalwart for sacrifice to a bottomless well of health costs, whispers on unemployment insurance, threadbare $20 bills would keep us warmer if we quilted them together, but we are a different kind of hourly now. Victory will not be an empty room, a single email, a quiet drink, cacophonous. It is at everybody's row home, singing off of everybody's front porch. All fire hydrants vomit lead, hiss in the street. Baby, you are horny because you are being traumatized with disease and fascism, but your body wants you to live. Baby, we are not dead until we are dead. Baby, still selfish, I want us to live. And that's what Mayor had to say. Whew. Wow. Thank you so, so much. Again, that was, those are poems that can, you know, make you laugh, make you cry and make you like, you know, just feel the need to, and that's a really, really amazing rendition of them. So again, that was Anna McColgan reading the poems of Meredith Hanlon, who, although Meredith couldn't be with us uh, tonight, you can follow them on Twitter at Meredethcore, M-E-R-E-D-E-A-T-H-C-O-R-E, -E -E, um, which has A, amazing tweets, and B, a link directly to that book, um, Zip Ties Between Zip Codes, available through Gumroad. Um, and you can also support Meredith directly in their recovery from uh, symptoms of COVID-19 through their cash app, uh, which is at MeredethCore, same spelling, M-E-R-E-D-E-A-T-H-C-O-R-E. -E -E. So 
it's you know the energy is in the air this evening and i'm really excited as we get to our last couple of readers to kind of ride this wave um and the next person who i'm excited to introduce uh, is another returner to performance anxiety and also a really good friend whose poems i'm always excited to read and i get to see a lot of them as drafts and that's a, a real privilege for me and that's joe Iani. and joe is a poet and performance artist from toronto um I, I can't say anything besides that, you know, the spirit that we have right this moment of bringing poems to life through reading them aloud. I, I can't wait to watch this follow its way through Joe's poems. So thanks, Joe, as always, and breathe some, breathe some poems for us. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Tom and Kristen, for putting this all together. Um, I had a moment listening to Anna earlier where I'm like, oh, you know, I should just quit. I should just quit. There's, there's too many good things going on in the world. Um, I'm going to read a few things and hopefully you like them. Uh, here we go. Everyone agrees to looking nice for interviews, but nice is a bad word. We break our backs to look good, put a nice face on whatever for whatever. It's not worth it. Take your makeup off, forget the shower, head to the beach. Why not? You gonna stop me? It's one thing or another, but if one of them's something you love, you'd rather sit here looking stupid? You could be looking stupid on a beach. There's nothing to cry about except things to cry about. Stones go smooth if it rains long enough and steady, steady like in April, it rains crazy. Then all that May green they promise in poems. But we could go to the beach. Each night runs its own clock. My eyelids hurt when I realize it's 3 a.m. I must be lonely. Some other half of me worried about what I need. When I dream, you can guess what I dream about. The beach. Crow took his pills three times a day. Their little head was kaput. Side effects included sleepiness, nausea, death, and memory loss, which was why Crow couldn't fly anymore or remember where they hid that ruby, the one the rubicator stole after he was fired from the monastery and dropped in the churchyard. Crow thought long and hard about the ruby, its hue, how it changed and reflected the sun. It was the most precious shiny thing Crow kept in the nest. The pills were a cheap imitation, bulby rouge gel caplets. They seemed to mock Crow every time with their hard swallow. But today, the side effects lessened. Crow miraculously remembered the shape of flight and leapt from the nest. But they did forget the ruby altogether. Sid, which is a common name among snakes, coiled under an ash tree carrying a fig in his fangs. He wriggled such that you couldn't distinguish whether the convulsions were sickness or ecstasy. It was the fig juice. It was unlike anything Sid knew. A gap in experience filled with electricity. When evening fell, Sid decided to slither away somewhere warmer, leaving the fang-pocked fig behind for worms or birds. Sharing is caring. But Sid forgot about his venom, lingering in the fruit and, for some reason, keeping it from rot. Thanks, everybody. That's it for me tonight. Thank you so much, as always, Joe, for sharing those poems. And I'm going to be thinking a lot about that ruby um, and forgetting it all together. Um, and that was, again, Joe Yanni, who uh, lives in Toronto and also who you can find living on the Internet on Twitter and Instagram at WTF is a poet. Um, Joe also ascribes to the sometimes poems to the timeline ethos. So follow 
those accounts for great poems. Um, so it's a little bittersweet to get to our last reader of the evening, but it's someone I'm, whose work I'm really excited to read and whose editorial work I admire very much. Um, this is Lee Potts, who is a poet from Philadelphia with work in several journals, including Kissing Dynamite, Rust and Moth, Gargoyle, Unbroken Journal, Parentheses Journal, and others. Uh, his poem Breath is in the current issue of Rogue Agent. Along with Madeline Corley, he is poetry editor, editor at Baron Magazine, the place that really publishes amazing stuff. So thank you so much, Lee, for closing it out with us tonight. And I'm really, really excited to hear your poems. And thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the problem with going last is I'm completely wrung out at this point. I'm not sure how much I have left. That was, that's really intense to sit through nine other readers. It was amazing stuff. Um, I'm going to start with a poem called Rate of Exchange, uh, which uh, just appeared in the uh, 845 Press uh, COVID anthology. I don't know if you heard about that, uh, but um, check, you know, go to their site, 8, 845 Press, and if you uh, donate to a small press or some sort of art charity or some sort of su support, uh, you can send them proof that you, um, that you donated, and they will give you a free copy of two really terrific um, coronavirus quarantine related poetry. It's really for a great cause. Um, uh, but this poem is from, from, uh, from that anthology. Uh, it's called Rate of Exchange. You slept on an uncounted coin. It pressed a mirror image like a fading full moon into the skin between two ribs, a shadow coin you carried into your dream to the bank where you'll always be mistaken for someone you are not. Waiting in line, you shared whispered gossip about a bloodless battle that goes wherever it will. Church spires stabbed into a suddenly quiet sky, waiting to catch lightning if it ever came, and their green copper arrows spun and spun as every ill wind blew in. All the cloth in the many mansions on the hill above the open graves was taken to wrap the dead and the ghosts could only watch from the dark windows of a million empty rooms. There could never be enough stiff white linen or even rags or old newsprint to shroud them all. You pressed your penny into the palm of the nearest dead hand and started closing all the open uncovered eyes. So that's a happy start. Actually, I realized when I was reading to prepare for this that um, they're really, it's not a very happy bunch of poems, so we're not going to sort of end on an uplift tonight, I'm afraid. This is uh, Near Disaster. The first day after our near disaster, coaxing leftover smoke out open autumn windows, you missed a bit tucked in that not near your heart, where blood meets breath, the source of all you know about what isn't ash or ember yet, and all you know of seeds that only crack open for the rain after wildfire passes. Um, this is uh, called The Finding of Names. We continue to watch his landmark shift to an empire he can no longer cross into. A garden far beyond the tree-lined dusk there harbors all of creation he can no longer name. Family photos now seem to him like penny postcards sent by strangers, wordless, arriving without address, depicting foreign places, the injuries time inflicts, and room after room of people he does not know. And one last one. Um, this is Crows Crave and Gather. Father abandoned his patch of ground, barren as a kiln's brick floor. Might as well plant rows of rust chips in coal dust, he said. He followed stars that said water north and finally settled like silt where the river widens and slows. He planted an apple tree by our home and willows along the water. 
Graveyards always occupy land no farmers desire. They de the departed are sown in the shadows of tombstones that tilt and dissolve as the rains erase words their dead never saw. Storms hide the stars all summer, and lightning reaches down, bores into the ground, and fuses soil, leaving behind brittle stone roots glazed as smooth as porcelain and just as slow to grow. As it rains, crows crave and gather rage back to their branches. They each watch with one eye as I tend to a garden my father will never see. And that's it. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Lee. And it's it's a real privilege when you you know you organize one of these and you get these fun things like a, a couplet of crows between your poem and Joe's like to to end. And you know we can't plan it, but that's it's so <laughs> beautiful. And um, again, that was that was Lee Potts, who you can find on Twitter at Lee Potts Poet, L E E P O T T S P O E T. Um, and Lee, again, you can find Lee's work in a lot of different places. Um, Breath is in the current issue of Rogue Agent and lots of these other magazines like Kissing Dynamite, Rust and Moth, um, but also um, as editor of Barron Magazine, I wanted to remind everybody that Barron's open for submissions, um, but we'll be reaching the cap for issue 15 soon. So if you want to get those submissions in, uh, please hurry and do that. Um, so again, it's like always kind of a little bittersweet to get to the end of a performance anxiety reading, but it was such a privilege to get to hear from all of our amazing readers tonight. Um, highest highs, lowest lows. It was, it was really spectacular. And our next reading, we're going to go back to our old schedule of, uh, the third Thursday of every month, which means that our next reading will be on May 21st. Uh, so we have kind of a heavy heart doing that, but um, Kristen's back to you know working on some homeschool stuff with a remote learning situation, and I I'm teaching remotely, and the every week situation was great, but we're going to go back to the once a month or so uh, frequency and and keep them special. So uh, in times like this, that the um, you know we had our 14th reading event, so I got all excited and was like, oh, we'll get 14 readers and it'll be sonnet themed and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, you know, chill. So that, that so we didn't have 14 readers, but um, I think sometimes those themes are maybe more tyrannical than they are like, you know, generative. So I'm just going to read a very, very short poem to wrap it up tonight. Uh, again, I want to thank so much all of our readers um, and thank you for giving this hour to poetry and listening. This is just a short poem poem by Noelle Cocott uh, called To Go Home. The will to make something beautiful out of nothing, two stars in the fury of the Big Bang. Nothing separates from anything. The light breaks on the keyboard. The anthills grow bigger. The flowers open and open. I say, touch me or let me touch you in a garden filled with daylilies. The sun will also set. We will become specks like that in the dusk, crying to go home.